Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's session. Thank you for joining us from wherever you are in the world. For those of you joining us each month, welcome back. And for anyone out there joining for the first time, welcome. We hope that you enjoyed today's session. My name is Armand Urban and I'm a member of the education team at the International Testing Agency. Before I go any further, please allow me to do some housekeeping. We are delivering this webinar in five different languages. On your Zoom menu, you should see a bottle called Interpretation. By clicking on this icon, you can select a channel with your favorite language. I will present this session in English, but you can listen in Arabic, French, Russian, or Spanish. Today's webinar is part of our educational model series that are designed to tackle key anti-doping topics and to raise clean sport awareness. As for all of our sessions, we encourage debate, interaction, and questions, and we trust you will join us in upholding the values of fairness, respect, and integrity. Then some other housekeeping points. Please use the chat function to tell us the sport you are representing, whether you are an athlete, athlete support personnel, educator, or if you are representing any national anti-doping organization or international federation. And please let us know in the chat. And I can see many of you are already using the chat, so I will pause for a moment to take a look. And I want welcome to our friends of Malaysia Fencing, Brazil, Tecbo, India, Fiji Islands, uh, our friends from the Wushu Federation, welcome, Qatar, Spain, Nepal, Philippines, Russia, Mexico, and many, many more. Welcome to today's webinar. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. And a reminder that you can use the Q&A function to ask any questions about today's topic. And we will leave some time at the end to answer your questions live. And please note that this webinar is being recorded and it will be available on our website and YouTube channel for those who can't attend the live session. As always, I'm also pleased to give recognition to our official presenting partner, Inform Sport. Thanks to their investment, we are able to offer our webinar program free of charge in five different languages. Inform Sport is a global certification program for supplements that batch test products for substances prohibited in sport. As you probably know, supplement contamination continues to be one of the leading causes of inadvertent doping. So we encourage all athletes and athlete support personnel joining us today to check sport.wetestyoutrust.com. The ITA is proud to be recognized by UNESCO as a leading international organization for the delivery of anti-doping programs. And this webinar is delivered with the support of the UNESCO International Convention Against Doping in Sport. All right then, without any further delay, let's move on to today's topic. Before we start, I'm happy to present the panelists who will be joining our discussion today. First, I would like to welcome Tracy Lambrex. Tracy is a former New Zealand weightlifter who competed in the 75 kilogram division. She won a bronze medal at the 2014 Commonwealth Games and a silver medal at the 2015 Pacific Games. Moreover, Tracy placed 13 at the 2016 Olympic Games. Tracy, thank you so much for being with us today. Welcome to today's session and the floor is yours. Uh, hello, thank you very much for having me here today. I look forward to um, discussing uh, supplement usage amongst athletes and hopefully um, answering some really great questions. I um, work for Drug Free Sport New Zealand, so clean sport is a passion for me. And I'd like to make sure that we um, have an ability to make sure athletes stay clean while competing. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Tracy, for your kind message, and we will be back with you in just a moment. Next, I would like to welcome Terence O'Rourke. Terence serves as the Business Development Manager for LGC Limited. Terence holds commercial responsibility for the company's supplement testing services and certification programs, including informed sports. 
Prior to joining LGC, Terence worked for the World Anti-Doping Agency in Montreal, where he developed the anti-doping expertise and experience that has been crucial in helping develop informed sport into the leading supplement certification program work well that it is today. Terence serves as a vice chair of the European Specialist Sports Nutrition Alliance and advises a range of sports and anti-doping bodies on the safe use of supplements. In addition to his commercial role, Terence has responsibility for developing partnerships with key organizations in sport and anti-doping. So please join me in welcoming me, Terence, whose uh, contributions continue to shape the world of sports nutrition and anti-doping. Over to you, Terence. Thank you, Armando. Um, hello, everybody um, from all parts of the world. It's um, it's great to be here with you today uh, with the ICA and and with Tracy. Um, as Armando said, I have uh, I've been working in this space for approximately ten years now, um, advising brands and key stakeholders in sport on how to manage the risks associated with um, sports nutrition. Um, as well as thanking the ICA, I'd also like to applaud them for addressing this, this issue. It is ongoing. Um, inadvertent doping, so anti-doping violations related to supplements, relate to approximately 8 or 9% of all doping violations. So it's a very important issue. Um, and I look forward to discussing and providing any assistance um, throughout this webinar. So thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Terence, for your kind message. And we'll be back with you in just a moment. So today, we are diving deep into a crucial conversation for every single athlete, which is guiding you through the potential risk associated with using supplements, of course, from an anti-doping perspective. Did you know that a significant 60 to 8% of athletes at all levels of sports use dietary supplements? Today, we want to make sure if you are one of these athletes or if you are considering to use supplements, you understand how to minimize the risk and know the best practices to make informed decisions. So what's on our agenda today? Let's break it down. We are starting off with the basics, covering the essential rules every athlete should know and should be familiar with, again, from an anti-doping perspective. Then we will dive into the world of supplements. I'm sure many of us have questions about what supplements are. Then how amazing it is to hear from an athlete firsthand, Tracy will share her real-life insights about the use of supplements. Following that, it's crucial for us to understand the risk. You know, knowledge is power. And being a work can help you to make informed decisions. An essential topic, batch testing. We will provide tips on how to ensure any supplements you are considering to use have passed the necessary checks. And to grab things up, we will ensure you have with you the best strategies on how to protect yourself and stay on the right side of the rules. Are you all set? Then uh, let's go with the first poll question of the day. A reminder that your answers in the poll are totally anonymous. And the question is, do you or the athletes that you work with use supplements? You can choose from yes, no, or I don't know. And let's give everybody a couple of seconds. If you say yes, uh, feel free to send us a comment in the chat to tell us which supplement you are using and why. Remember that you, we are here to share experiences, learn, learn more. And of course, we will try to give our best advice. So please don't be shy. And now let's give everybody a couple of seconds to answer this poll. And I see very quick responses coming in. Thank you so much, everyone, for your participation. From an anti-doping perspective, it is important to remember that athletes are bound to anti-doping rules. And here, I'm referring to the oral anti-doping code and the strict liability principle. This means that athletes are solely responsible for any substance found in their sample. This is regardless of whether a substance was intentionally or unintentionally consumed. The principle of strict liability requires the 
athlete to take a high level of personal responsibility. We know from scientific data that supplements can contain prohibited substances because the supplement industry is not world regulated. Therefore, using supplements puts athletes at a risk of a positive test. Even if there was no intention to cheat, an athlete will still have to face the consequences of a positive test. So let's take a step back and briefly define what supplements are. There is no one single definition. Each country, organization, even different disciplines might define supplements differently. For the purposes of today's session, we follow the INC consensus statement on dietary supplements which mentions that a dietary supplement is a food, food component, nutrient, or non-food compound that is purposefully ingested in addition to the diet with the aim of achieving a specific health and or performance benefit. We know that dietary supplements come in many forms, including functional foods, formulated foods, sport foods, single nutrients, and multi-ingredient products containing different combinations of all I just mentioned. As I mentioned earlier, we know from different studies that the use of dietary supplements happens in all sports and at all levels of competition, from recreational athletes to the top elite level of sport. Recent studies have uh, indicated that approximately 60 to 80% of elite athletes report consuming a dietary supplement at some point throughout the year. So today, we want to equip you as athletes with the tools to empower you to make informed decisions and to minimize your risk of inadvertently ingesting a prohibited substance by using supplements. Before I go any further, I would like to emphasize that neither the ITA nor anti-doping organizations endorse the safety of any supplements for athletes as there are no 100% guarantees. We always recommend that all athletes in the first instance use a food-first approach. For those of you who might be wondering what is the food-first approach, the food first approach, very, very simple means that you need to think about your diet and what to implement before you think about using a dietary supplement. Always I also emphasize the need to work with a qualified and experienced nutritionist to assess your needs as a person and as an athlete. For more information about the food first approach, please refer to our previous webinars in our YouTube channel. And before we navigate through today's topic, I would like to welcome Tracy to share her experiences during her sports career. Welcome back, Tracy. It's wonderful to have you here today. And Tracy, what about if we take a trip down memory lane? Could you share with us some of the standouts, achievements, highlights from your sports journey? All right. So um, I actually moved over from South Africa to New Zealand when I was about 13 years old. And I started my sporting career really in athletics. Um, but from there, we decided that maybe I needed a little bit more structure and that I had better opportunities in the sport of weightlifting. So I uh, moved over to weightlifting and I've been competing there from about, I'd like to say 2003 to about 2018 when I retired at the Commonwealth Games. Um, some highlights of my career is that I've pretty much traveled the world, um, participating in a sport that I really, really love. Um, I loved having the world championships in Disneyland. We were there for two weeks um, where I competed in my first world champs. And that was quite an amazing opportunity for um, a girl from a little country, you know, at the bottom of the world that not many people realize is there. Um, I've had the opportunity of having a coach from Finland. So we would have training camps in Finland, you know, training up to three times a day sometimes um, and really put in a lot of work to make sure that, you know, I was up to international standard to compete at um, certain events. I really loved the opportunity to be the flag bearer at the first Pacific Games where New Zealand was invited to compete. Representing New Zealand to me, which is my second home, is just, 
it's an amazing feeling because they've, um, you know, welcomed me with open arms and they've trusted me to represent New Zealand um, as a clean athlete and to always put my best foot forward. So flag bearing opportunity was just, just a great, great experience to have the team, my team do the haka for me. Um, very overwhelming and also just, just very proud of, of my team. And then probably my two biggest competitions was the Glasgow 2014 Commonwealth Games where I came third and a lot of people will think well third but to me it was just as good as first place because um we happened to be in a well, I beat Australia by one kilo which uh, um, is huge considering our competition with Australia and then um yeah representing New Zealand at the Olympics and placing 13th which only really became a goal of mine after um watching the 2012 Olympics before that, I hadn't really had any desire to go to the Olympics, but then with my training and my teammates and just people believing that I was able to do it, then it became a goal. And yeah, I was very happy to achieve that in 2016. Now diving a bit deeper, I'm curious, and I believe others here are too. Did you ever consider using supplements at any point in your career? And if yes or no, what influenced that decision? Uh, I think we're really interested to hear this from you. So um, throughout my career, when I first started off, I had to um, drop a weight category. So we did that strictly through diet. Um, as some athletes might know, when you're in a weight restricted sport, sometimes dieting can make you quite a grumpy person. So we decided to then go up a category which was a lot better for me because I was able to eat more foods, healthier foods. Um, and then I wasn't really feeling like I lacked anything. So I didn't feel the need for any supplements because everything I needed, I could eat without worrying about the um, weight restrictions. I think the biggest challenge for me was 2018. Um, for a specific reason, I had to drop down into the lower weight category to compete at my third Commonwealth Games. So I had to lose over 18 kilos in three months, which is quite a lot of weight loss in a very short amount of time. Um, so that was probably the only time that we did look at potentially using supplements because I was on a very low calorie diet. Um, however, I was lucky enough to be able to have a great dietitian who um, I guess she specialized in weightlifting and we worked out a plan that, you know, supplements are available to me, but they would be the last resort. Um, and they would obviously be batch tested, but understanding the liability and that my career was at risk potentially by contaminated supplements. Um, we did manage to stick to just that low, low food diet. I wasn't as grumpy as the first time I had to do my cut, but we managed to, yeah, pretty much drop the weight, stick to um, foods that I was happy with, that I was comfortable with. But we did always have that potential to use supplements as a backup plan. But yeah, we never really needed to at any point, which was, I think, quite good. Thank you, Tracy. It's wonderful to hear that you always manage to meet all your energy and nutrition needs from food. Um, perhaps my next question is uh, for you, was that a challenging approach uh, to maintain? And perhaps if you can share with all the athletes joining us today, how did you achieve this? Uh, maybe some uh, details of your daily routine. So there's a question okay. here. Did I lose muscle? Um, being in a strength sport and having to do such a big cut in, in quite a short amount of time, I did lose some muscle, but not enough to really um, affect my performance, you know? So obviously as you get lighter, you're not going to lift as much as when you were heavier. There was some muscle loss, but it was mainly fat. I had quite a lot of that to lose when I was cutting down to the um, under 90 category. Thank you, Tracy. Now I'm curious to know uh, if there were any moments where you felt pressured by anyone in your environment to consider taking supplements, uh, yes or no? And how did you manage those situations? 
I guess your insights could be incredibly helpful for many athletes. Yeah, so there were times where there were um, sponsorship offers. Um, there were also, you know, flatmates that I used to live with. They would be using supplements as well. Um, I was never really pressured by a coach or any teammates. I mean, we all respected that we had different requirements. Some athletes happily use supplements, but again, they were at a high level. So they understood the importance of making sure they were batch tested and they understood the liabilities um, associated with potential contaminated supplements. So I mean, there are definitely times where you're tempted to use supplements, like when you're unorganized or if you're just really tired and you can't be bothered making food, you know, supplements are that quick, um, a quick fix, I suppose a lot of people would say, but the, the, the right way to do it is to one, yeah, make sure you have a dietitian and make sure that you plan for your food, your recovery. You know, it's it's not just important what you do on the field, on the track, on the court. It's important what you do off that that helps you make sure you're the best athlete you can be. So I just, I guess I always had good food, you know, coming from a South African family as well. Mum was always happy to make sure I had quality food. Um, so yeah, supplements, I couldn't really afford them most of the time, but also um, that whole liability thing, I'd rather have just figured out a different way if need be. Weightlifting in New Zealand is quite a small sport and uh, there's not so much support um for us well when I was competing there wasn't that much support so my main go-to was to my dietitian and she was involved and understood all the um you know drug-free sport rules from WADA and also New Zealand drug-free sport there was also my coach who would help me look into things I mean our drug-free sport New Zealand website has so much information and they're really easy to reach and great to uh, have a conversation with so they were always available um and then you know when I did make the Olympic team and building up to the Commonwealth Games we did have access to our high performance team and they I mean they're up to date with all the wider stuff because they have a lot of international athletes underneath them so it was making sure I went to the right people um, and not looking at stuff like TikTok or social media. I made sure my information came from the correct sources that were credible and qualified, and they actually understood what I was trying to achieve as opposed to just being maybe a potential like recreational athlete or an athlete that just played sport for fun on weekend. So I went to people that understood um, what my goals were, and they helped me out. Thank you, Tracy. And perhaps uh, to finalize the, this section of the webinar, any words of advice, even recommendation that you would like to offer to our audience today when it comes to supplements use? I guess what I want to say to athletes is this is your career, this is your future, and then at the end of it all, it's your legacy. So don't be scared to ask questions. If someone suggests that you use a supplement, you have every right to ask why. What is it going to do for me? Is it safe? Is it batch tested? How can we make sure that this isn't going to return a failed test? Do not feel the pressure that, you know, this athlete uses something, so maybe you need to use something. There is no quick fix. Make sure you focus on, you know, your training, your recovery, your nutrition, and if you do feel the need to use supplements, which some people might and some people might not, and that's 100% your choice, just make sure you're getting the right information from the sources that have the correct information. Don't risk your, your health um, and your future potential um, on a quick fix because you, you've forgotten to make food or you think that it's going to be better than eating food. Make sure you do the research. Make sure you know what you're putting in your body. And just know that food is just as good as anything else. Tracy, I can't thank you enough for all the insights, experiences you have shared with us today. Your journey, uh, discipline uh, for all the athletes uh, joining us today. It's truly, I would say, an inspiration and such an uh, enlightening conversation for us. 
Uh, well, thank you so much for that. And then uh, as we move forward with our webinar, now we will shift our focus on understanding why athletes make the decision to use supplements. Then turns will be uh, guiding us through an overview of some uh, current aspects and trends. Following that, Tracy will uh, rejoin us to go again into the critical need for clear educational strategies and tools for you as athlete. So what motivates athletes to use supplements and how is this related to risk? Now, uh, there are many different factors that can influence the decision of the athlete to use supplements. And then they can be classified in different ways from social, economic, cultural, environmental, medical, nutritional, um, psychological, and many more. So let's take a moment to step into the athlete's shoes and let's discuss some of this. First, uh, let's consider the social factor. Picture a young athlete in a team where everyone is using a particular supplement. The feeling to fit in the team and align with the team practices might of course change the athlete's choice, even if it's not the most informed one. Economically speaking, the availability of resources also plays a part. Imagine an athlete on a tight budget gravitating towards less expensive but potentially less reliable supplements due to financial constraints. Culturally, traditions and beliefs, of course, also take a role in the decision-making process. An athlete might lean uh, towards supplements that uh, resonate with their cultural beliefs and practices, sometimes, of course, uh, bypassing scientific recommendations. The environment also plays a role. All the resources available around the athlete also guide the choices. An athlete in a remote location might choose to only consume uh, online supplements, of course, due to limited local options. Medical and nutritional needs are also uh, significant drivers. An athlete who is recovering might be advised with certain supplements for a quicker recovery and perhaps to meet certain nutritional deficiencies. Psychological influences, we know uh, it's also very powerful. The mind's uh, interpretation of success stories tied to specific supplements can steer, of course, an athlete's choice uh, to uh, use a supplement. In the age of uh, social media and aggressive marketing, of course, the campaigns that we see on social media, the influencers will advertise products. They have also a role in the athlete's decision. Vulnerability factors like age, lack of experience, uh, lack of advice. Uh, young athletes might be more susceptible to catch uh, the marketing campaigns or the influence or the, of the teammates. Education, uh, educational background also influences the decision-making process. Well-educated athletes from different countries might do more research than the ones who don't have access to information. Athletes with broader access to resources, of course, are more empowered and they do better decisions. So each athlete carries a unique blend of all of these factors, uh, making them an individual uh, perception and having their own way of thinking about supplements. So if you put all of these together, then we are very to, uh, we have a very position to advise the athletes. Uh, then as we move to the next part of uh, our discussion, let's uh, transition into a critical aspect for us, by uh, which is considering what information we can rely on and how to avoid misleading sources. But before we go with that, let's go with another uh, poll question. And the question is, what is your source of information about supplements? Is it your national anti-doping organization, perhaps any app like uh, ChatGPT, your coach, athlete support personnel, uh, any teammates, uh, famous sponsor athletes on social media, or any other? And uh, please here, feel free to uh, make a comment in the chat. And we can see that many of you actually go to your national anti-doping organization, which is great. Some of you coaches, some of you also use ChatGPT, and uh, we'll take a look at the chat to see other uh, answers. So thank you so much for your participation.
So I would like to welcome back Tracy, perhaps to discuss uh, any educational strategies that you might want to also share with the athletes. So Tracy, uh, welcome back and uh, over to you. Yeah, so I think it's really important that, you know, if your national um, anti-doping agency offers education, 100% you guys should accept that and, you know, do the workshops, do um, any online learning that you can do. It's really important that as an athlete you do empower yourself and know where to go for information. There is um, the WADA website, there's the ICA website, and then potentially, depending on your country, there's your NADO website. It's really important that we don't focus on what influencers and other people are doing, that we focus on ourselves, and that we always feel the ability to ask questions. We should never just always do as we're told. We have the right to um, double-check what we are putting in our body, making sure that it is okay. Trainers love to think that they know everything, but I guarantee that most of them won't be qualified. So if a trainer is recommending supplements, make sure you do educate yourself and make sure they know about the education so that you're both on the same page. Um, yeah, I guess it's just really important to, I saw on the chat there someone say Global Dro. So Global Draw, you can only check medication, not supplements. So really important to understand that, you know, supplements and medication are very different and Global Draw will only do um, the medication side of it. But yeah, educate yourself, um, do the programs. These sorts of education uh, presentations are amazing and they're free. So always take advantage of people trying to support you. Be aware of those people who are just using you as a tool and those could potentially be, um, you know, certain supplement companies or even people within the organization. So, yeah, do the education, empower yourself and make sure that you know how to make the right decisions. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, then now over the next few minutes, we will explore also the potential risk associated with supplements and we'll also discuss how you can minimize the risk if you choose to incorporate them into your routine. So I'm happy to uh, give the floor to Terence who is here to share his expertise with us. Uh, over to you uh, Terence. Thank you Armando. Um, if we could go to the, the next slide please. So over the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to discuss with you a number of areas around the potential risks associated with the use of supplements. So we'll look at um, what are the sources of supplement contamination. Um, we'll discuss what is what is batch testing. We'll put a bit of a focus on um, certain levels of certification and, and programs. I'll give you some insights into the informed sport program and how best to avoid taking supplements which um, can be contaminated and which can then um, impact your career. So what, what are the sources of contamination? The, the company I work for, LGC, which is a big international science company, they've been testing supplements for the best part of 20 years now. And we have plenty of data to show that there are three common causes of contamination. The first one is that the contamination can come through raw materials. So every supplements product is usually made up of multiple different ingredients. And those ingredients can come from various places within the world. And some of those places may have high levels of uh, manufacturing standards. Others, maybe not so much. We also are finding more and more that, that companies that manufacture are using what we call botanical ingredients. These are plant-based ingredients. And these are very complex and in themselves can contain um, substances which uh, may move, go on to be prohibited. So if a, an ingredient is contaminated, that can introduce contamination at the very start of the manufacturing process of, of a supplement. The other main um, cause is what we call cross-contamination. If the manufacturing facility is handling banned substances, possibly to uh, manufacture medicines or pharmaceutical goods, then it is quite easy for those banned substances to then 
um, get involved in the manufacturing process of the supplement. We test supplements down to what's called parts per billion, and this is the level of um, detection that the, the WADA anti-doping laboratories use as well. So if you imagine that it doesn't take much of a banned substance to get into the manufacturing process to contaminate it at those very, very low levels. Now, the third cause is what we call adulteration. I suppose technically it's not it's not really contamination because it's when a manufacturer intentionally puts a prohibited substance into, into a product. So these disreputable companies, um, they, they know that there is a bit of a market for it. There are certain types of supplements users that want to either get a, a bit of a buzz or a bit of an advantage when they, they think they're trying to, for example, build muscle. So those are the three areas of contamination. And um, if we go to the next slide, please. Now we know contamination exists not just because, as I said, the company LGC, which, which owns and administers informed sports um, has been doing this for 20 years, but we know because there have been a lot of studies over, over the last 10 or 15 years. The first one was conducted back in 2000 um, with the support of the IOC and was performed by the Cologne Laboratory in Germany. They tested a vast range of, of supplements, different types of matrices from all across Europe. A total of 684, 634 products and almost 15% came back with um, evidence of, of steroids within them. Next slide, please. This obviously was a, a major concern, and it, you know the, the the reason why the IOC did it was to try and put the spotlight on onto this as an issue. Um, since then, <coughs> we, there have been multiple other studies that that show similar evidence of contamination. Next slide, please. I'm not going to go through each of these um, surveys, but they they as you'll see, they've been done in the USA, in the UK, um, in Europe, in the Netherlands, and and down in Australia. But what is very, very clear from each of these surveys is that contamination does exist. And we say as a rule of thumb that if um, if a supplement product is not on a certification program, then there is a, a one in 10 chance of that supplement being contaminated with substances banned in sport. Next slide, please. We also know that contamination exists because INADO, which is uh, an organization that supports the national anti-doping organizations, they did a survey um, earlier this year into um, the anti-doping violations. They looked at 630, 683 violations from the Anti-Doping Knowledge Center, and they found that in 166 of those cases, um, contamination was argued as the cause of that violation. And that, that's a whopping 24% of, of all anti-doping violations. Now, not all of those cases <clears throat> was it proved that contamination was the cause. And unfortunately, sometimes an athlete, if they do um, commit a violation, they will very often look for an excuse and they will then blame a supplement. But certainly they found that in 48 of those cases, which is 7%, that um, that contamination was the cause of the violation. Now, getting data like this is, is very difficult. It's, it's, it's challenging for the anti-doping community to find out all of the <coughs> data around the different violations. But certainly this, this piece of work from Anardo shows very clearly that contamination is an ongoing issue and that athletes have to be very, very wary of it. Next slide, please. We also know um, that there, as, as well as in, in, in being involved in, in a certain number of cases, that there are anti-doping violations of, of high-profile um, high profile athletes. I think in this slide we should have seen um, an example of an athlete called um, CJ Uja, who was uh, uh, an athlete who competed for Great Britain at the Tokyo Olympic Games. He was part of the four by 100 meters relay team. He, this was during um, lockdown. He decided to, to select a, a product from Amazon. That product hadn't been tested. It was not part of a, um, uh, a program like Inform Sport. 
He took it. Unfortunately, it was contaminated. It led to um, him failing a, a doping control test. So not only did he lose his his silver medal, his three teammates did as well. He could have avoided that very simply just by making sure that the product that he was purchasing was on informed sport. Next slide, please. I think one thing to consider, and this is a term that is used a lot in um, around the supplements industry and education is, is batch testing. To my mind, batch testing can be a little bit misleading because sometimes it's used as a, a generic term to show that a product is safe. Unfortunately, that, that is not the case. Um, batch testing can mean a lot of things, to, different things to, to different people. If we have, quickly have a look at what is a batch, Supplements are manufactured in what we call production events, and each production event is essentially where they manufacture a batch of a product. Um, so inventory, so different um, different capsules or, or different powders or, or different bars, that inventory that comes from that batch will all have the same batch number on, on the label of the product. Sometimes it's called a lot, and the term lot is used regularly in, in the US, for example. Um, but essentially what a batch number does, it allows the manufacturer or the consumer, if need be ever, to, to trace the manufacturing of that product that they, they, are, they are using. And next slide, please. As I said, batch testing can mean different things to different people. So th there's, a, there's a very real need to qualify what is batch testing. For example, when people say batch testing, do they mean that every batch is tested? Does it mean X number of batches are tested? What does the testing involve? Who performs the testing? When does the testing occur? For example, will the testing occur after that batch has been released to market? So consumers and athletes are using it and only then will the testing happen? Or does it happen before it's released to market? How do you know if your batch has been tested? Are the tested batches available? There are a lot of things that um, unfortunately people make assumptions around batch testing and it's very important to actually dive in a little bit deeper. Next slide, please. So to my mind, the best way of making sure that a product that you are using is safe, not only safe in terms of um, being contaminated with bad, bad substances, but also safe in terms of any potential health risks, but also that is manufactured to high quality standards is to make sure it is on a reputable testing and certification program such as informed sport. Athletes, trainers, nutritionists, sports, anti-doping officials, they need to do due diligence behind the testing program before automatically just saying, oh, has it been tested? Is it on the program? It's no good just saying that. You have to look into what the program involves. Is there full transparency about the program? Do you know exactly what the laboratory is testing for? Do you know exactly what the certification involves? What banned substances are they testing for? It's no good saying, oh, we tested for 30 banned substances, and then you find out that the product's contaminated with a banned substance that's not been tested for. That, that's, that's pointless. Is the laboratory that's doing the testing, is it accredited to the recognized ISO 17025 standard? That, that is very important. When is the testing performed? As I, I said in the previous slide, who manages the program? Do they have the relevant heritage in anti-doping, the expertise to be able to make sure that what they're doing provides a credible and robust assurance for, for athletes? Are all companies held to the same standards? You may have one company which is spending a significant amount of money with a testing program and therefore they may not be held to quite the high standards and robustness you may have another company which has to um, meet other requirements so there, there has to be full transparency and also consistency and also what does the program permit there are a couple of labels on the right side of this slide which say 100 percent drug free that should never be permitted by a certification program Another one below saying guaranteed banned substance free. It's not possible for any laboratory to make these guarantees. The prohibited list, which is the, the WADA list, that is open ended. You know, there, there are references to compounds with a similar chemical structure to, 
And also, it's very important to remember that no laboratory can test for every banned substance. If they attempted to do that, it would be prohibitive for any certification and testing program because it would just take far too long, it would be far too expensive, and it would defeat, defeat the object. Next slide, please. So what we've tried to do at Informed Sport is provide um, what we consider to be the most rigorous and safe program for athletes that are choosing to use new supplements. Informed Sport was created back in 2008. It was um, developed with the input of uh, the UK Anti-Doping Agency, UCAD, and also Doping Authority, which is the, the Dutch or the Netherlands Anti-Doping Agency. And essentially, there are, there are two two parts to the, to the certification program. The first one is how do we allow a product to join the program? And this is what we call the certification progress. And this is an extremely rigorous assessment of the manufacturing process um, that's, uh, that's involved in, in manufacturing the products. We will look at the, the food safety um, standards of that uh, manufacturing facility. We will look at all of their standard operating procedures. We will look at the ingredients that are going into a product, the formulation, whether the manufacturing facility is handling banned substances. It's a very, very rigorous online assessment that the manufacturer must complete. At the same time, we will test five samples of the product that is undergoing certification. This gives us a testing history and it obviously allows us to identify whether there are any banned substances in that product. Once a product has passed certification, it must then meet very strict requirements. And the, the principal requirement is that every batch of that certified product must be tested and it must be tested pre-release to market. So that means no batches will go to markets and no inventory from that batch will be available for athletes or the general consumer until it has received a negative testing result. Only that way can we have the assurance that there are products out there that have not been tested. We will then list the, the, the product owner, so the brand name and the brand logo onto the Informed Sport website. And we will give each product what we call a dedicated product page. Now I will show you a little bit of evidence of this on the um, next slide. And also very importantly, we will review the manufacturing of the product on a regular basis. So if the if the manufacturer or the brand introduces a, a new raw, ma raw material or a new raw material supplier, we will have to review that just to make sure they are compliant with, with the, the program. <clears throat> As I mentioned, once a, a product is certified, we will list it on the Informed Sport website and we will also list it on the Informed Sport app, which is available to, to um, consumers and athletes it's across the world. The next slide, please. And this website allows what um, is, is vitally important, a very simple search for, for brands, for products, and for evidence that batches have been tested. So an athlete or a general consumer, a gym goer, can go onto the website, they can use the search function, they can search for a specific type of product, or in this case, on the right-hand side, we, they've searched for a, a specific brand. Next slide, please. That will bring up um, the, the various products that are certified either under a type of product or under a brand. And in this case, it's brought up a recovery shake, which is um, an example you can see here is the, the dedicated product page for this product. So there will obviously be a product name. There will be details about the product, very simple details. There will be an image of the product so that the, the athlete in this case can cross-reference the product they're using to make sure it is in fact the same as the, the products that's on the product on the dedicated page. This this is quite important for um, certain parts of the world where counterfeiting does go on. Um, so an athlete can get the assurance, okay, this is the product which I, I should be using. And finally, and most importantly, they can cross-reference the batch number of uh, the products they are using. So they can check the label and make sure that that batch has been tested. And this is vitally, vitally important. It's, it's what we call the due diligence that an athlete has to undergo. And next slide, please.
So some of the key key lessons from that for athletes, it should be that they should only ever use a product that is on a uh, respected testing and certification program, such as Informed Sport. But make sure you do your due diligence. Don't just say, oh, it's on any old program. Make sure it's on a program that meets the highest um, standards of, of rigor and, and testing. Make sure that the batch has been tested before you use it. And you can do that by going through the cross-referencing, as I mentioned before. And then keep records of that. So take a screen grab or take a photo and make sure that you have that um, detail. Because as an athlete, you can then um, submit it on your doping control form. Just as if, for example, you were to be using a... Um, uh, a medicine or a cough mixture or something like that, which you, you want to then make sure that there is that has been captured on your form. Also, make sure that there is a, um, a sample of the batch you're using that you can have tested again if need be. And that's one of the great things about informed sports. We will secure a sample of every batch that we tested so that if there was ever a reason an athlete had to come back and have it tested again, we have it securely stored. And as I mentioned, keep a record of everything you are doing because that is vitally important. If we can go to the next slide, please. As I mentioned, Amanda mentioned earlier, um, the World Anti-Doping Code is, is um, based on the principle of strict liability. So whatever an athlete puts in their body, they are responsible for. It's, it underpins everything within the anti-doping community. And because of this, athletes have to take responsibility for what they consume. Next slide, please. Well, the great thing is that the, the World Anti-Doping Code does um, recognise that there, there is an issue with, with contamination. I'm sorry, could we go, go back to the previous slide, please? Thank you. Um, so within the code, there is a certain amount of flexibility. So they, they, it, it's under the terms of um, no, signi so no significant fault or negligence. So if an athlete can show that the product they used was the cause of their doping violation, they can get their sanction reduced. It can be reduced theoretically down to just a, a warning. They will have committed the violation because of the principle of strict liability, but their sanction will be much reduced. So it is vital here that the athlete does their due diligence so they can show a tribunal, if ever they have to, that they looked into, they researched the product, they made sure it was on a programme like Informed Sport, they made sure the batch was tested. They they keep screen grams and evidence of it, and they've submitted that on that doping control form. If they can show a tribunal that that was the cause, then their sanction will be significantly reduced. It is like an insurance policy to to use programs like Informed Sport. Next slide, please. Thank you. So as I mentioned, due diligence is absolutely vital it's it you're protecting yourself um is the testing accredited and is the testing broad enough are the program requirements robust i can say with hand on heart that the informed sport program provides the highest levels of protection and essentially this is what an athlete should be looking at every time they decide to use a, a sports supplement they must protect their career protect their reputation and protect their sport there are many, many cases of athletes committing doping violations due to um, contaminated supplements. If they had just taken these simple steps, and in, in essence, essentially, informed sport is taking the steps for them, but if they had just taken those simple steps, they would not have committed the violations. And I know for a fact that many would um, much rather have used um, a program like informed sports just to avoid any of those issues. And next slide, please. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you very much, Matt, and I'll now pass back to Armando. Thank you, Terence, for the informative session on batch testing and the risk of supplements for athletes. Now let's uh, shift our focus for, uh, to the final part of our discussion. First and foremost, understand your personal needs. Before you decide to use a supplement, it is essential to have a deep understanding of your specific needs. Consider your body's individual characteristics, your specific discipline, the sport you are engaged in, and of course the intensity of your training. 
Remember that you're totally different from everyone else and your requirements might be different. As we just discussed, please engage with experts to identify what you are doing right or wrong. For example, a sport nutritionist will be able to give you advice based on your energy requirements, your sport, your dietary habits, your body composition. If you are a boy or a girl, your age, and many things that you can address with an expert. If you do not have access to a certified nutritionist, please conduct a self-assessment with the help of your doctor, your coach, your national anti-doping organizations. And please also check the resources that are available online. For example, Informed Sport and the ITA have free resources that, can, that you can use for guidance. A reminder, always please keep in mind the importance of a food-first approach. Your nutrition should be around real whole foods. Also remember that the supplement industry is not well regulated. There are many supplements products available on the market, as we just discussed, that are mislabeled. Ingredients might not be properly listed, and the supplement may contain a prohibited substance that is not listed on the label. There are many uh, independent companies that test supplements around the world, and on your screen you can see a few that we recommend. If you consider using supplements, it's absolutely crucial that you always check the product label and the ingredient list. If the supplement label you are considering contains something like proprietary formula, extreme focus blend, improved cognition formula, performance formula, lose weight formula, etc., please, please be careful. Stay on the safe side and avoid them as they can hide specific ingredients and their amounts. And this means that they might contain prohibited substances, so you will not even have an idea of what's going into your body. Remember that the proprietary blends and formulas they might sound like one of the primary ingredients that you want to buy. Also, essential to be aware of the claims made by supplement companies. Don't fall for phrases and promises that might sound impressive to you. Remember that companies can use uh, flashy marketing to sell products, but these claims are often not true. And you can see a couple of examples on your screen. Finally, understand the risk associated with supplements. This is paramount. Always prioritize a risk-benefit analysis and always consider the potential health consequences alongside the anti-doping concerns. Finally, as mentioned earlier by Terence, it's crucial to declare any supplements that you're using on doping control form. If you, happen to, if you happen to be selected for doping control, ensure that you declare your supplement use in the appropriate section. If you have been using supplements and have done your due diligence, be completely transparent about it and make sure you can provide evidence to support your statements. Finally, always make sure to uh, be aware of the latest updates on the rules, regularly check for updates uh, about the prohibited list, attend anti-doping education uh, webinars, programs, and seek guidance from your sport organization. So wrapping up now, I want to leave you with some useful links. These are the main places I would like to point you if you want to know more about the topics we cover today. So it's time to move to our live uh, Q&A. And I can see that we have plenty of questions. And the first question is from uh, Peter Barker. The question is, can all prohibited substances found in supplements be detectable in during and blood test? Uh, Terence, would you like to tackle this? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit of a tricky one because... Um... To a degree, in principle, yes, but if um, if there was a, a banned substance in the supplement at a, an extremely low level, that wouldn't necessarily um, relate to a uh, an athlete committing a violation if their blood or urine was tested. But yes, in principle, everything that is tested for, all the banned substances that are tested for in, in supplements, yes, they, they can absolutely be identified in, in blood and urine. Absolutely. And I, perhaps I hear, I will 
just like to add that the ability to detect a substance depends on many, many factors, including, of course, the substance, how it's absorbed, uh, distributed, metabolized, and, of course, excreted by the body, and, of course, the timing of the test. All right, so let's go to the next question from uh, Sharon. Uh, have there been examples of accidental acid contamination via contact with others, clothing, eating, and drinking uh, utensils, and so on? Any thoughts uh, on that, Terence? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting one. It, it, it doesn't just relate to supplements on this one, does it? I mean, I, I think there have been cases in the past of, of athletes claiming to, for example, have kissed someone and then they they somehow that banned substance gets into their system. There have been examples of um, people inhaling cannabis from a, a passively inhaling it at parties and things like that. Um, but with related to supplements, not not so much. No, I mean it's not only supplements that can get contaminated. Of course, there are there are, there's cases of of meat products, for example, getting contaminated when. Farmers have been known to inject their cattle with certain sort of um, muscle-enhancing anabolic steroids. So, um, so it can happen, but with, with supplements, it's not so much uh, um, a, a danger. We were at the one of the games where um, they had a smoothie bar, and so what athletes were doing is they were going to get their smoothie but they were also taking along their own supplements and then they were mixing the supplements up in that smoothie bar. So I think um, the contamination risk was there um, for other athletes potentially because you don't know, um, you know, what other supplements the athletes were using. They were just handing over powders for other athletes, for the staff to put into the smoothies. And because we don't know how well stuff's actually being cleaned. So um, our national federation actually said maybe don't get smoothies from there because you don't know if there is some contamination you don't know what other substances those other athletes are using you'd like to think they're all um batch tested but it's not just yeah it's looking at the bigger picture like when you're going out to cafes if you're going out to other facilities where they're offering um protein shakes or smoothies you know are they using the same equipment for everything and if you are Getting smoothies with added protein, how do you know that protein has been batch tested as well? Because, I mean, in New Zealand, a lot of cafes offer you supplements. So they say, well, if you want to make your smoothie into a protein smoothie, we've got protein powder. So there is that risk of contamination um, there, which I think is worthwhile taking a note of. Yeah, absolutely. And and just to add to that also, Tracy, if, if you're – using a product where it's been sort of been made in front of you then it's, it's obviously not sealed so there's all sorts of risk that can be introduced into that whether it is the um the sort of the machinery that is being used to to make that that product or whether or not that you know somebody's using the ingredient which indeed might be um might be uh, contaminated and and also going back to the point that you know the isc has advised in multiple um, Olympic Games over the years for athletes only ever to eat in the official um, canteens so that they help to minimise the risk of then picking up uh, any any form of contamination, whether it's through, a, you know, as I said, a meat or possibly it could be through a sort of another type of ingredient. But, um, yeah, the athletes have to be extremely careful. Thank you so much, uh, Tracy and Terence. And perhaps to tackle the last question, we are running out of time. And the question is why WADA or any national anti-doping organization does not recommend at least basic supplements like whey protein since at least it doesn't have any side effects or if it's not contaminated and every batch is tested? I think there's a number of reasons why um, WADA or national anti-doping organizations don't recommend supplements. One, because um, there is still some doubt as to which supplements an athlete should be taking there, there is there is no absolute guaranteed evidence that using a particular supplement will necessarily benefit you yes some supplements can and there's been plenty of evidence to show that but it's not their job it's not Wada's job or the Leonardo's job to say use this to help your performance to help your training to help your recovery that is not their job their job is to warn you of the the dangers that that exist around using it and um 
yeah, that that's it's. I'll, I'll let Tracy add a little bit to that one as well. Um, yeah, I have been asked that when I've done workshops with other athletes. You know, why can't you just tell us what to use to make it safer for everyone? And at the end of the day, it comes down to again us not knowing what the athlete needs and the athlete needing to take responsibility for their own decisions. Um, with the whole liability and the consequences that come with it, it is a huge, huge responsibility. And I don't think that's fair for the organization to take on. But also as uh, an organization, we should be promoting that food is enough, you know, food first approach. That is our recommendation. So I don't see why we would suddenly start recommending supplements and going against our, our own recommendations. So, um, yeah. Absolutely. And, and I guess from our side, uh, we are dedicated to, of course, athletes, athlete support personnel. And how we do this? Well, we deliver a comprehensive uh, support to all of our partners. Of course, this includes uh, conducting educational sessions like the one we are all currently participating. We also raise awareness about the importance of clean and fair competition. Also, some other things that we do during uh, sporting events, uh, we actively uh, engage with athletes to provide uh, information, answer questions, and to promote, uh, I would say, different clean principles. And I guess uh, that uh, wraps up our session. If you still have questions or if anything wasn't answered today, you can always reach us at education at ita.sport. I hope you are now feeling uh, prepared to take any informed uh, decisions when it takes two supplements. Thank you, Terence, and thank you, Tracy, for all the work and your time. Finally, if you'd like to receive any updates from the ITA, please sign up using uh, the link and the QR code that you see on your screen. Thank you all once again, and I wish you a great rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.